Hi everyone. I think we should uh, we should start. Sure. So um, welcome uh, welcome this evening this afternoon for those those joining from other countries. Um, we are Transylvania Executive Education. We're happy to have you here with us. And for those who are here for the first time, um, we are a provider of executive education based in Cluj Napoca. And we reunite several major educational and business stakeholders, such as Banca Transylvania, UBB, Emerson, Technical University, and Dava, and other major stakeholders in Cluj. And our aim is to provide executive education and connect the companies and entrepreneurs in the region with the opportunities of international business. And uh, as some of you probably know, we deliver the executive MBA of the University of Hull in Cluj, which is the only genuine British MBA in the region. And speaking about British, we have uh, this evening with us uh, David Collins, who is a professor uh, in management at the University of Northumbria, Newcastle, and the founder of managing the and managing director of Gain Insight Ltd, a consulting organization offering bespoke services on uh, human resource management, organizational change, transformation. Uh, and David, he's a dearest, he is a dear friend of us. Um, he is back in Cluj virtually, but uh, he's been here uh, delivering lectures at the MBA, doing research, uh, doing work with uh, with companies in Transylvania, and um, he's uh, an experienced uh, academic uh, working on uh, storytelling. He has recently published his uh, sixth book. The organizational storytelling workbook and uh, this evening he will share with us some some of his findings and probably also um do some exercises with you i guess so over to you david um thank you very much for video it's a, it's a great pleasure to be back if only virtually in cluj napoca uh, and it's wonderful for me to have this invitation again um to talk about uh, my work on storytelling and in particular my new storytelling workbook. Um, the reason that it gives me such joy um, to talk about the storytelling workbook is that the book was uh, conceived and developed in many ways in partnership with uh, one particular organisation um, based uh, in Transylvania um, and so it's great to come back here uh, in order to um, to share with you uh, my thoughts uh, and my reflections on stories and storytelling. Um, one of the uh, participants uh, just before the talk began was teasing me that each time I come back, virtually or otherwise, uh, to speak in Cluj Napoca, I'm associated with a new university. Uh, and here I am once again um, associated with um, a new university, the uh, Northumbria University, which, which is based in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, which for anyone who's interested uh, was about the farthest, most northern reach of the Roman Empire. Um, the Romans gave up um, just on the border of Scotland. Um, they decided that we were altogether too civilised and too poetic um, uh, to merit conquest, and, and so they left us alone. In fact, they built a big wall to keep us out. Um, my talk today If I can manage to share my screen. Um, I've called organisational storytelling, harnessing this powerful management and communication tool. Uh, and for reference, that's what I looked like uh, before lockdown. Um, I may share my screen later on and you can decide amongst yourselves uh, whether uh, lockdown has been kind to me. My presentation today is brought to you by two truisms. Uh, and for reasons I'll explain in a moment, this is not an auspicious way to begin a presentation. You see, a truism is an essentially truthful statement or projection. There's a kernel of truth in everything I'm about to say today. But if we're not careful, I will end up offering you only cliches or platitudes. So a truism is something which is essentially truthful 
but in being repeated again and again and again, begins to lose any sense of worth, value or meaning. I'm very careful that I don't want to do this. So I want to offer some challenges to the essential to two essential truisms. The first of these I will express in terms of modality, and it's probably worth pausing for a moment to remind ourselves what a modality is. When I use the term modality, I'm taking my inspiration from a French thinker called Bruno Latour. Bruno Latour has some very rude things to say about you guys. He's, he's an urbane and decent man, so he's not racist. He's not being rude about Romania. He's not being rude about the Roma people, but he is pretty rude about audiences and readers. You see, Bruno Latour is an expert. I, I refuse the term expert, but Bruno Latour is an expert, and he warns us that readers and audiences are willful, stubborn, and obstinate. He warns us that, you see, if you want to speak physically or virtually, one of the things you have to do is you have to take control of your audience. If you fail to do this, you will find that your willful and stubborn audience is inclined to form an opinion contrary to your own. So he invokes a hydraulic metaphor. He says that you will start necessarily with some conjecture or controversial statement. And the role of the expert is to move the audience very, very quickly downstream to a position where the conjecture has been combined with other facts and other understandings in order to form a black box, a fact which is accepted tacitly and in silence. So my first truism relates to the discussion of organisational culture and expressed in terms of modality, we can see at least three steps in the movement downstream from the point where we begin with a, a controversy or a conjecture, organisations have cultures or organisations are cultures, to a point downstream where the further we move and we need to move quickly so that people aren't allowed to change their minds or move against the current and go back upstream in order to challenge your initial thoughts. So the second uh, step in the modality that I've put in is that cultural analysis notices and allows those facets of life that shape how people think, feel and act. So in cultural analysis, we need to be observant. We need to look with fresh eyes. We need to look quizzically at those other things uh, that constitute our lives that are familiar to us. And Ruth Benedict, for example, writing in 1934, offers us various different um, studies of um, cultures located in various parts of the Americas, the southern United States and in the the, in South America, and she says, what we need to do here is come to a modest understanding of cultures that are somewhat unfamiliar to us, so that we recognise at one level just how arbitrary and manufactured our own cultural lives and our own cultural understanding is. So the third element in my modality then, that you can see knowledge of those factors that shape thought, feelings and actions, because that's what we're talking about when we talk about culture, will enable strategies for change, the purposeful development of new opportunities and fresh horizons. So we've moved from the initial point where we're saying that the pueblos of the southern states of America are cultures to a position that says, if we take, for example, Ruth Benedict's appreciation of what it is that unites, integrates and in some sense variegates the cultural formation of the Pueblos, then we will have the opportunity to challenge what we think we know of ourselves and take control of this in order to bring about purposeful change. Or, if you prefer, cultural analysis suggests that we will boldly go where no one has gone before. Um, I'm hoping and assuming that you recognise my cultural reference to Star Trek, because uh, I want you to remember these guys, because we're going to come back to them in a bit. Moving on to my second truism. 
My second truism, again expressed in terms of modality, is to do with organisations and organisational storytelling. So the initial conjecture, or if you like the controversial point, organisations are essentially story worlds. They are aggregations, constellations, arrangements of stories that situate who we are and tell us what we might do under particular circumstances. The second stage of the modality you may recognise really comes from the work of Carl Weick. Carl Weick's an American um, thinker. I guess you would call himself a social psychologist. He says that we use stories in order to navigate complexity, to filter ambiguity. And he reminds us that on a daily basis, we live our lives under circumstances where if we attempted to respond to each and every element of sense data that comes our way, we would very, very quickly become bewildered. So Vike says that we use stories to filter out the complexity of our lives so that we can actually get on with business. He says essentially what we're doing is we construct stories to explain and to situate what it is we should be doing. And in so doing, we filter out much of the noise of our lives so that we can focus upon the signal. The second stage of our modality again takes us to another point where the truth claims around stories and storytelling become that bit firmer. So the third stage in our modality, the difference between leadership and management turns upon the application of stories. I'm not altogether taken by these categorical distinctions that are made between leadership and management. Nonetheless, the literature on sense giving storytelling, and I will return to this in a minute, um, tells us that leadership turns upon the application of stories because it's through uh, the development and through sharing of stories that new possibilities, new avenues for commercial development, for example, become possible. So the final stage where the truth claim around storytelling becomes uh, much firmer uh, and takes control of our thinking or our consciousness is the, the fourth grey block here. Those who have learned to control the story world will retain the ability to animate and to orient, orientate customers, colleagues and stakeholders. And these two points are important. The stories animate, they start activity, they get us going under conditions of ambiguity and uncertainty. They tell us what we should do under any particular set of circumstances. They give us a map for our conduct. And the second aspect, the orientation. The stories point us in the right direction and keep us going when other forms of motivation or other forms of threat, for example, are no longer potent. So far, so little then. My truisms, of course, are not false. They, they are truth, truthful by definition, but they are rather a long way from the full story. So let me try to explain and hopefully you'll be glad you came. Now, the next stage of my presentation is just a little risky because we have to indulge ourselves in a little bit of theatre. And the important part of theatre is that we have to willingly suspend disbelief. When we visit the theatre, we have to accept, for example, that Hamlet's father will appear as a ghost and will trouble his soul. Unless you can accept that ghosts can exist and ghosts will wander on the battlements and befuddle your otherwise troubled mind, then nothing magical can happen. So let's just try then just a little bit of theatre. I'm going to try some magic. I will now take steps to control your thoughts. And I need you at this point to open your minds. Don't block me. I know you weren't expecting magic tricks this afternoon. I know you expected serious stuff about the business of management from a grown up professor. But I need you to think. Let's try a little bit of magic. Open your minds to me. Concentrate. Keep concentrating. Keep thinking. Now, I need you to do something for me. I need you to channel your minds for me. Do not think about rainbows. And my next slide will show me what you are thinking at this very moment. Trust me, there's a point to this. OK, that's a fail. You all thought about rainbows. Now, 
Let's try a little something else, if anybody's still in the room. I will now read your minds. Think. Define organisational culture for me. And if you like, you can open your mic and you can offer me a definition. Open your minds. Don't block me. Concentrate now. And I'm guessing that you're telling us this. The organisational culture reduces to a pithy aphorism, an often repeated phrase or truth, a truism, how we do things around here. And of course, that's perfectly truthful and yet a long way from the categorical or definitive truth. There's just more going on here that this pithy aphorism just can't get a hold of. To say how we do things around here, for example, is to lock us in a continuing present. To say how we do things around here is quietly and tacitly to make an in-group and an out-group. Who's we and who doesn't count as we? Now, these are all the significant and very important elements of cultural analysis. These are all the things that the anthropologists such as Ruth Benedict tells us that we need to become aware of. So, for example, in the rites of passage that signal the development of manhood, we have to say, so is manhood triggered by puberty? Does manhood allow you to engage in certain forms of dance, for example, that are denied to children? Because in those circumstances, the rite of passage and the definition of manhood might occur quite early on. It might occur around the age of 12 or 13. But in a culture where manhood is associated with joining a warrior caste, manhood occurs later. You need to be a bit bigger. You need to be a bit more hairy. You need to have some stubble on your chin in order to be taken seriously as a warrior. So in those cultures that define manhood associated with war and warlike behaviour, the cultural references and the cultural rites of passage occur a lot later. How we do things around here then matters according to what the significant things are and who we take ourselves to be. So, the definition preferred by Deal and Kennedy, because that was their approach that was in the previous slide, is a long way from a definition of a culture. But their basic intuition is sound. Culture represents a pattern for action. Culture is something that we can infer from obs the observation of ceremonies, of forms of speech, of interactions, of dress codes, of religious ceremonies, and so on and so forth. The difficulty I have when managers and organisational scholars begin to talk about organisational culture is that we finish up with an inventory of symbols. We finish up with a whole warehouse full of symbols and dress codes and meetings and stationery, top hats and umbrellas, if you want a stereotypical image of the British civil servant or businessman. But we don't learn really very much about the patterns of thought feeling and action that underpin these dress codes and ceremonies, nor do we really learn much about where they have come from or indeed where they're going. Culture has to be then more than a pattern of action. It is, of course, also a pattern for action. And that's why organisational scholars are so interested in culture. If culture just gave us a means of compiling an inventory of the sorts of things that people do at work, organisational scholars and management gurus wouldn't be interested because who cares with description? If you want to make a difference in the organisational world, if you want to become known as a management guru, and I don't, thank you, description and prescription must be added together in order to make a course of action and a pattern for action too. So the image that I have on this slide, I'm going for um, double points on English cultural references. What we have here is you will call it a, a London bus. It's more appropriately known as a, a Routemaster bus, and it's one of the quintessential symbols of English uh, for those who live elsewhere. The other uh, part here 
is you should note that the bus is a special bus which is taking people to and from the Wimbledon tennis and it doesn't really get much more English than uh, Wimbledon in June. All the things that we associated with the English and with Englishness are probably captured in this picture. But there's a third element that you might not be fully aware of. This is a bus queue. Um, until relatively recently, it was the law that you had to wait for a bus in an orderly single file queue. It was against the law to do anything else. Um, that law has been scrapped and people no longer typically queue up in a long file in order to enter the bus. They sort of array themselves around the bus stop in a, an apparently haphazard manner. But what cultural analysis does is say, let's pause, let's linger here for a minute and see what happens when the bus arrives. Now, what becomes apparent is that when the bus arrives, there has been a queue formed in the minds of those who are apparently haphazardly arrayed around the bus stop. And we can see this queue in action because as the bus arrives, the people step forward in turn in order to join the bus in the order that they turned up at the bus stop. And there's something cultural taking place here amongst a group of people who may never have met before and may have only this very, very fleeting interaction between them. We can see that conformity is expected because if you step forward and it's not your turn, something very English will happen. People will stare at you and will make a tutting noise. And if you continue to uh, join the bus, when it's not your turn, there will be censure associated with your conduct. People will tut and mutter. And we have to say that the rules of engagement culturally vary, however. If this was a taxi rank at midnight and drink had been taken, if you attempted to board a taxi, in an order that did not reflect the queue, it would probably lead to a violent altercation. So what I'm saying then is that culture is not just an inventory of the things that people do, it offers an account for and a route into understanding why people do the sorts of things that they engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. Culture just, just not constrained absolutely. We have a tendency to think about and talk about other cultures as primitive cultures, and we have a tendency to suggest that culture enforces itself upon us such that we have no ability and no opportunity to do anything other than culture demands. I don't actually accept that um, because culture is altogether more complex than this allows. I've put, because it's a local audience and I want you to like me, I've put up some pictures of one of my favourite places on earth, uh, Cluj-Napoca, and the beautiful women uh, who inhabit that fair city. But I'm not going to lecture you on your own culture, not for the moment anyway. What I want to draw attention to is that our understanding of culture and our understanding of history isn't based upon what happened. History is what you can remember. And what you can remember is filtered culturally. The Scots historian says of my own culture, the history of Scotland is very much like the geography and topography of Scotland. Some of what we know of Scotland and some of what we know of Scottish history is visible on the peaks. And these peaks, for example, are known as the Battle of Bannockburn, uh, the Battle of Loudon Hill, the declaration of our broth in 1320. Unless you think we spend all our time at war, the cultural peaks, the historical peaks of Scotland would be associated with the names of explorers, Sir David Livingstone, Mongol Park, and they would be associated with the names of inventors, John Logie Baird, and uh, scientists such as Sir Alexander Fleming. The rest of Scottish history is a bit like Scottish geography. It's down in the valleys and it's shrouded in mist and rain. And I'm guessing, if you're honest with yourself, that Romanian history is much the same. We remember certain elements and we overlook or downplay other elements too. The culture has developed historically and it's maintained socially. We've got two images here. I think the image on the left, which is in a more vivid colour, I think that's the recent demonstrations over what 
my good friend and colleague, Dr. Andy Taylor, informs me as an attempt to legalise political corruption. Uh, and the other image um, is uh, from a, a slightly earlier period. Um, I'm old enough to remember it. Some of you will have lived through it. Uh, and that's the, the revolution in 1989. The point I'm putting together is that while culture has developed historically, it's maintained in and through social groups. Remember our bus queue and the censure and the tutting and the muttering, sometimes the violence in the taxi queue that follows on from there. And culture is negotiated individually. I put this slide up just to uh, inflame uh, my good friend Tibby, um, who is a fan of one of the Cluj teams and can't understand why anyone else would want to choose the other. You negotiate your own cultural norms, your own cultural beliefs, your following of a football club um, on an individual basis. And actually cultural norms and values are very much the same. So in the first book that I wrote way back in 1998, I drew attention to the fact that I consider myself to be culturally main mainstream. And then over the following paragraph and a half, more or less documented all the things that I'd pinched from my employer uh, over the course of two years of employment. So the fuller truth behind the truisms of culture and indeed the truisms of storytelling is that our values, how we think, feel and act are altogether more complex, more dynamic, more porous and altogether less manageable than we would like to imagine. And your own biography, I suggest, will reveal and demonstrate this to you. If the cultural norms, values and beliefs were such that they enforced our behaviour, we would be unable to discern any real dynamism in our culture. My parents were born in 1925. Um, unlike my parents' generation, my generation is altogether less likely to get married. It's altogether less likely to stay married and it's altogether less likely to do things in the normal order. It's my parents' generation, more or less, although they were certainly hypocritical around this, would get married and then have children. Um, I didn't conform to that order. Nobody explicitly or openly changed the rules of British or Scottish culture. And at one point, I guess, the manner in which I live my life now would have attracted some level of disapproval and scorn from my elders. But these days, no one really seems to change. And what's happened? Quietly on a day-to-day -day basis, the rules that by which we live our lives have been bent, not altogether broken, but they have been bent and modified and changed. You see, when our cultural prescriptions don't really work, we have to come up with some way of fudging this. So there are, for example, uh, tribes in the South Sea Islands that have so many prescriptions against who you are allowed to marry um, that it's almost impossible to find someone legally and appropriately that you're allowed to marry. And what do you do in those circumstances when the cultural prescriptions ban marriage? You elope. Now, technically, what should happen is if you elope, the tribe would pursue you and kill you. But if you make it to an island and it's difficult to get across the water, they'll forget about you for a while. And the modified cultural fudge seems to represent an understanding that if you can stay away long enough to have a child, you may be allowed to come back and live lawfully and legally and with support within the tribe. You might have to allow yourself to be beaten up gently when you return, but the cultural prescriptions are fluid, dynamic, porous and open to negotiation. So there's a paradox then within our cultural understanding and within the approach that we take to stories and storytelling too. And I capture it like this. There's the assertion and the truism that crowds have wisdom, and yet we understand that we get the power of stupid people in very large groups. And while I'm talking about stupid people, the assertion that stories provide a reliable means of securing control over thought and action is now central to the account of culture, is now central to the account of what we take to be the job of the leader. The trouble is that we require so many conjectures to hold that this becomes 
unsustainable for me. So we have to accept then that a top down view of the organisation will be sustainable. And yet cultural analysis freed from the desire to make change, to bring about total quality management or just in time production or whatever else you want to talk about, demonstrates that most of the stories that circulate in our cultural formations arise from the bottom up and exist in many ways to parody and to mock top down assertions. We understand and began by saying that stories uh, represent an exercise in sense making and an attempt to deal with the flux and the complexity of our lives, we tell ourselves stories to reduce the complexity. The managerial account of storytelling says, well, if people have to live their lives through stories, the job that managers have is to construct stories that make sense for other people. Well, that's fine as a broad assertion, but the, but the sense giving account of storytelling has to be able to establish and fails to establish that stories remain stable as they travel through the organisation. And the final part as well that I want to draw attention to here, and we could continue on in this vein for quite some time, um, were it not for the limitations of timing, is that the stories we tell, if you look at them very carefully, and if you look at them as not part of the we, but as part of one of the outsider groupings, make it very difficult for some people to have full organisational membership. So, for example, if we look at the stories that are told typically about organisations in terms of commitment, in terms of your overwhelming commitment to the customer, it be soon becomes apparent that if you have elderly parents, for example, who need care, or if you have child caring responsibilities and so have to divide your commitments between the customer and your family, and why would you want to do anything other than that? It becomes very difficult to establish that you deserve full organisational membership. So the stories apparently developing a means um, to control how people think, feel and act are actually telling a significant part of the organisation that we now depend upon. And we've never depended upon women more than we have done through the pandemic. It was women that kept the service organisations going. It was women that kept the schools going. It was women that kept the hospitals running. We've never been more dependent upon the female workforce. And yet the stories we tell again and again and again say to women, you don't really count, you don't really matter, you don't deserve full organisational membership. Do you remember these? Oops, I'm not sure how we got so quickly there, my apologies. Do you remember these guys, the guys in red shirts from Star Trek? Their function? Well, their function was to get shot in the first couple of minutes and set the scene for uh, the ensuing uh, adventure. My suggestion is that too many of the stories that we tell of our workplace and too many of the stories that we tell to our employees say to them, you don't really count, you are dispensable, you're the guys in the red shirts in Star Trek. So the key aim of my storytelling workbook in the last few minutes available to us is to, the reveal, to reveal and to redeem the analysis of culture by facilitating the development of authentic tales that usefully model the essential complexity of social organisation. What's the central problem that arises under just in time? Now, I'm guessing you're going to say things like short buffer stocks make the organisation vulnerable to industrial action and the interruption of production, and the interruption of production costs millions of pounds for each moment of downtime. And that's true. Just in time makes us particularly vulnerable to a broader infrastructure that we can't control. So if the roads aren't maintained and the roads become congested, it becomes very, very difficult to have low buffer stocks. So just in time then opens up the boundaries of the organisation and might require, for example, a greater alliance between local government and local business organisations. And all those things are true. But I want to take you back to a point that was made to me almost 30 years ago when I worked at another university in the northeast of England. At that time, I shared an office with a rather lovely man, and I'll call him that now because he's dead, um, who was from Liverpool. My colleague, Sid Weston, and those of you who know Liverpool will understand that the cultural stereotype associated 
with Liverpool is that the city is full of rascals and that these rascals will rob and steal anything that's not nailed down. Uh, that's a cultural stereotype. And of course, like most cultural stereotypes, it has some element of truth within it. Forgive me, Sid. But Sid said to me, the central problem that arises under just in time is that with very low buffer stocks, which are controlled and inventoried through a computer system, how does anybody get to steal anything? How do the people who work in that organisation get to alter the terms of their contractual relationship by pinching stuff from their employer? If just in time rules out thievery, what other forms of industrial relations system uh, might emerge to take its place? Point is this, that our accounts of culture are overly formal, overly top down, serious, white, male, and apparently comfortable with pretty horrid forms of conduct. The grid that you can see here is the grid which attempts to ascertain cultural formation in relation to two key variables, the extent to which the organisation is exposed to risk and the pace with which the, the usefulness of that risk becomes apparent to you. So, for example, in the bottom right quadrant, the bet your company culture, you might regard as being associated, for example, with General Motors or Ford. So Ford plan, plans to reduce, uh, sorry, to produce a new, uh, a new model. It's making decisions today which are multi-million pound decisions. It will be millions of pounds to test and design the car and multi-millions of pounds to retool uh, the factories in order, in order to make that car. They will bet the company, in a sense, on a decision whose usefulness and utility will only become fully apparent about 15 or 20 years from now. And the, uh, the discussion of Dylan Kennedy suggests that that leads to certain sorts of cultural understanding and cultural interactions. The difficulty I have, the tough guy macho culture, the bet your company culture, is that Deal and Kennedy seem to observe certain forms of bullying behaviour without the need to draw attention to the fact that these forms of conduct are inappropriate. In fact, the process culture, which you'll see in the bottom left hand grid, is deemed to be organisational form that has very low risk and very low forms of feedback. When Neil and Kennedy discussed these cultures, they basically discuss administrative centres, places where women typically work. And when they describe these administrative centres, they are very comfortable in announcing that they are probably neurotic. Now, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as a particularly senseless eh, and sexist way to be talking about how people behave at work. I'm not clear that they are neurotic. They might have cultural formations cultural behaviour of a particular form, but to say that this actually makes for some kind of mental pathology is, for me, unproven and pretty insulting, actually. My point is, the stories we tell, ostensibly to animate and to orientate, are bland and largely inauthentic. The bottom left-hand corner, you see a poor man falling down the stairs. I've put that up because my Italian friends tell me that there's a proverb in Italy to the effect that the funniest thing in the whole world is your best friend falling down a flight of stairs. What I'm saying is that our accounts of culture and our accounts of stories deserve one another because both miss most of what's going on. They miss romance at work. They miss, and these are the profanity symbols that uh, Goscony and Udero uh, used to, um, to deal with Asterix and Obelix swearing. Nobody laughs within the stories we tell. That sort of profane laugh that occurs when your friend falls down the stairs. Nobody falls in love. Nobody cheats on their partner or whatever else within the workplace. All the things that we know to be true, all the things that are central to the dramas that we watch on television, all the things that are central to the dramas of our lives are all missing from the accounts of culture and the stories that we use to animate and orientate people. So my storytelling workbook offers an extended and entertaining account of culture and the hope that we can redeem culture through an account of storytelling which makes a connection with the profane and the sacred aspects of life, the funny and the filthy, the rude and the loud, 
the quiet and the unnoticed. I offer reflections on the nature of stories and storytelling, which generates 14 maxims for storytellers. Actually, that's a lie. They are 13 maxims and one axiom. An axiom is a self-evident truth. And maxim number 14, my fake maxim, which is actually an axiom, is that the person with the best stories, not the most stories, will triumph. And what makes for the best stories? Well, you need to buy the book. And you need to go through the 20 storytelling exercises developed therein that will give you the confidence um, that you will require in order to place your plans, your dreams and your concerns in the heart of others through stories and storytelling. But if I tell you any more about the book, I will run out of time uh, and you won't buy it and my children will go hungry. So I'll be quiet now and I'll invite questions and hopefully I can offer some useful answers. Are there questions coming through in the chat or video, or would people simply like to open their mics uh, and ask me questions now? I don't see any questions for now, okay. so I kindly ask the participants to either type them down in the chat box or simply um, uh, spell it out. So we have Bashir raising his hand. I think he wants to ask something. Yes, Bashir. Hello. Good afternoon, Dr. Al Zawawi. Is that the first time you've been called that in public? Yeah, probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for 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 others. I was uh, uh, a student of David for for probably four years, yeah, mm. for the PhD, and he was a really very good uh, supervisor, first supervisor. So I have changed the supervisors for three three supervisors, David. I think you were the fourth, third, I think. Yeah, the fourth and most stubborn. Four, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I had no trouble with David. He was really very perfect. So David, just uh, I really have thank you for the, the uh, presentation. I'm just really impressed by the uh, organization. You talk about the organization culture, mm. but because you are giving, you have you have been going through an experience of changing the uh, positions from university to universities. Yeah. How do you see the differences between the I'm not saying that is the organization you work in, but in general, you know, gen generally speaking, how do you see that? What defined organization, organizational culture in one particular uh, organization uh, and differentiate it from the others? And the other thing I would also, um, yeah, that's, that's my question. Yeah, if I remember the other one, I will maybe okay. back again to that's it right. if I get the chance. Yeah. It, it, it's a it's a very uh, interesting question um, and, and a response to it might well get me dismissed um, from my current employer. So I'll. I, uh, <laughs> I, so I was I'm, aware of that. Yes, I'm only but... kidding. But, but you are quite right. And universities um, are cultural formations just the same as everything else. And the joke about universities is that academic politics is fought over so fiercely and so strenuously um, because the stakes are so very small. So it's about people um, getting into very serious disputes about how many angels can dance on, on the head of a pin. Um, I can offer a longer term perspective. So if I look back on academic conduct uh, now and going back more than 30 years since I started, one of the things that is apparent is that academic discourse has become a lot more polite. So when I started in academia, seminars such as this would often end up in blazing rows. They would adjourn to the pub and there was always the risk of a punch up towards the end as people uh, became more and more entrenched in their positions. Mm -hmm. Modern universities, I think culturally are distinctive and quite unlike the universities um, that I started in where, where they are so much more clearly managed in a top-down fashion um, from above. And there's much tighter um, budgetary controls, much tighter controls over the way people move and interact in an attempt to control the movement of academics, their, their time um, or, or on a on a on a day-to-day -day basis, if not an, an hour to hour basis. Um, I'm biased of course, but I think I prefer the old days, even though sometimes the seminars got a bit fraught. 
Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it helps a lot, but yeah, yeah. Thank you. Are there more questions? So um I don't see new questions in the chat box, but I kind of feel tempted of asking something, David. You're welcome. So I was thinking um to our, our societies today and companies, they become increasingly diverse. Even in even if Roma even in Romania, which is not yet, let's say, an immigration country, mm -hmm. but we see um, workplaces that become more diverse, culturally speaking, or nationally speaking, ethnically speaking. How can we create a common story uh, from all this diversity? Ah, how yeah. can we deal with this? I think it's an interesting question, and 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 I guess I would throw the question back. Why why do you want a common story? Um, if stories um, translate as they move throughout the organisation, then one of the things that you might have to allow and one of the things that you might have to loosen up to is Latour says when he's trying to control his audience, he says you have to recognise that the fate of facts lies in the hands of the users. So having written it once and having taken steps to control your, your audience, you have to recognise um, that the story will then belong to the audience your account of that particular cultural formation will then belong to the audience. So the trick is then to develop something which holds at the centre, which nonetheless has a certain plasticity to work at the fringes too. So if you want a story that works for a diverse um, organisation, uh, if you want a story that indexes um, diversity, then my suggestion would be that you take steps very carefully not to make it exclusionary at the outset. So if I go back to the story about um, or, or my suggestion that many tales of organisation act to exclude women because they demand total organisational commitment, one of the things that you can do in order to enhance diversity is to make sure that the stories you tell have a certain authenticity associated with them. So rather than demand continuing presence, rather than demand full commitment to the customer, recognise that your employees have lives and concerns beyond the organisation and be prepared to offer stories which openly, honestly and truthfully take account of that negotiation. Make it legitimate, make it honest eh, and allow people to have that point. And at that my suggestion is under those circumstances, um, you will have a diverse organisation and you will have a diversity of views, um, which is more sustainable. Yeah, and I think we need this more than ever in, in this context nowadays, when people are facing with different challenges, working from home. Yeah. Um, yeah, encountering all sorts of problems at work. Mm. Yeah, so thank yes, you. I like I like the phrase that comes from the English government at the moment as we uh, begin to lock down more and more of the population is talking about punishing people, criminalising hmm. behaviour and visiting fines upon people. I'm biased, of course, but if you look at the Scottish government, the Scottish government's advice is be kind, look after women. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, an essential cultural difference between the administration of England and the administration of Scotland. One wants to punish, one offers a reason to do the right thing that does not resort to punishment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a similar uh, approach in Romania in the yeah. first part of the uh, of the of the pandemic. Yeah, I remember um, Andy Taylor telling me that the army was being brought out and I asked him, "What what is the army going to do? Is it going to shoot the virus?" <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they were they were on the street with the police yeah. as well. Now, I understand there's a historical context yeah. whereby the police aren't accepted as naturally legitimate. And any time you want yeah, but, to the legitimacy of the police, you get the army on the street. In the France, is there, the, in Libya, they have the police on the street just to close the shops, you know, just push people. But because everyone has gone there, no one has gone to, mm. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to obey the rules, you know, so... Yeah, I mean, as the father of an 18 year old, I'm concerned that, um, uh, that that certain forms of behavior which are ordinarily expected of 18 year olds all of a sudden become criminal. I would prefer a Scottish approach that says be kind and be sensible rather than 
than seeking to control and define. Yeah. yeah. So do we have any other questions from the audience? I have one. Yes, please. Cam camera's off, camera's on now. Uh, so Dave, uh, got a question regarding to unarticulated cultures. So there are organizations with an unarticulated culture, organizational culture. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see storytelling in this kind of organizations? Okay, I, I guess I would say that, that just because we're not aware of it or just because an elite isn't aware of it it doesn't mean that it's, it's unarticulated you can come to know it and you can come to understand it if you're patient if you're open or you're honest or you just take some time so what i would say is one of the ways to come to understand culture one of the ways to redeem your understanding would be to open your eyes and your ears to those they're not so much unarticulated as hidden from view and often they're hidden from view because they don't want you to know what they're up to so you have to find some way of connecting with those groups and with those organisations. One of the things that I used to do um, when I was dean at a previous university um, was go to where people eat, go to where the students hang out and very rudely eavesdrop on their conversations. Then you begin to understand, I guess what you're calling the unarticulated aspects of life, you begin to get glimpses and um, insight into things that you can come to understand. And if you're lucky, and if you hang around there long enough, people will begin to join you at the table and will begin to speak to you so that you don't have to just eavesdrop on their conversations too. But it can take a while, and you might eat alone for a very long time to begin with. Leave your desk, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, indeed, uh, unarticulated in terms um, of vision. Sorry, missions. David. Uh, please, please sorry. David. No, I think he's giving you the floor again. OK, so yeah. for, in, in, I was just uh, saying to David, if you could turn turn your presentation off so we can see you. Um, sorry, I did. I did suggest that lockdown hadn't been kind to me. I'm back in the room. Have you got me Let's see. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, indeed, unarticulated in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, if an organization doesn't wish to uh, put a, its, I don't know, its organizational culture on its walls or mm -hmm. this sort of uh, 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 attempts, let's put it like this, maybe even. Uh, accept uh, uh, various and multiple organizational cultures from clients and taking pieces from it. Uh, so in, in this term, unarticulated, indeed, every organization has its uh, 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 organizational culture, but in terms of not being an organized one. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and that would, mm. that would be the point that that cultural life tends to be spontaneous. And actually, the more spontaneous the organizational culture is, the more holistic and integrated it, it tends to be. It's the non-spontaneous forms that we get through an attempt to manufacture organizational culture, that, which is full of contradictions. And that's why where we find the contest between the top down and the bottom up stories and the bottom up stories spending so time mocking the formal structures that are supposed to exist uh, and prevail. Because in my experience here, uh, Bashir, I think you're on mute, but in my experience here, I, I, I see clusters perhaps of uh, subcultures or microcultures, which indeed start to be uh, I, I influenced by their, I don't know, ecosystem or, or their yeah. factors, their networks. And uh, they're basically, as 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 I've seen in your uh, presentation, some constellations, basically, of uh, yeah. of stories. Yeah. Or yeah, and 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 the notion that we we should expect to find a single unified culture, um, it wouldn't exist anywhere else other than in a management seminar, would it? Because if we look at Romanian culture, you would say there are various different constellations and subcultures, youth, mountain people, city people. I've been to Romania often enough to know that there's a wonderful, a delicious rivalry between Cluj and Bucharest and all these other things, which are more or less real and more or less false. And the 
the, the myths we tell ourselves about, um, now forgive me, Florian, I'm not sure where you're from, but the people of Cluj are supposed to be down to earth and sober and decent, where the people of Bucharest are supposed to be altogether less friendly and, and so on and so forth. Of course, all of that's true and none of it's true. But we accept mm -hmm. and we endorse all those things and, and we enjoy all those things. Um, we've just somehow taught ourselves not to accept those things within within a power plant or within a bus company or, or whatever else. Yeah, thank you. And if there are no other questions, I have another one. Uh, what about perceptions, different perceptions of the same uh, organizational culture? And I'm guessing here that you alter your, uh, uh, your understanding of that culture and that somehow uh, derives in, in multiple versions of the same story, perhaps. Yeah. How yeah. do you see this? I, I think it's, it's more or less inevitable. And if you're trying to come to some common understanding again, it's not going to happen, but you might get there with stories that are, that have certain attributes which hold at the center, which are nonetheless plastic enough to allow certain kinds of translation towards the edges and towards the fringes. Enough space for people to place something of their own identity um, within them. And the other point that, that I make in the book, um, and this was before the global pandemic, I suggested that um, good stories were a little bit like viruses. Now, I, I, trust me, I was writing this in September last year before anyone had even heard of COVID-19. But the point being that stories like viruses need hosts. So if you want your story to go somewhere, you have to find avenues and conduits where people will take the stories and your ideas will travel through the organisation. One of the points, again, coming back to eating alone, um, if you're not meeting regularly with people from beyond your organization or beyond your own specialism, your stories aren't going to travel very far and they're not going to have um, genial hosts that will take the story almost as ambassadors for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. You're on mute, Bashir. You're, you're, you're on, on mute. mute. I, can you hear me now? I can. You you mentioned something very really very interesting. You're talking about the travel of ideas. Yes. Which is which is also embedded in translation theory. Yes. Uh, do do you think that is idea still travels effectively through uh, communication to one another while we are living in this modernization of uh, social uh, social uh, uh, media around us. So the story on the social media, how does that differ from the story on the that running in the organization? You know, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Um, see, at one level, I, I was joking with a colleague at the University of Bristol. And yeah. I was saying one of the things that the lockdown actually makes it easier to do is to visit other people's institutions virtually and offer seminars. So normally yeah. you would say, well, I would love to visit Bristol, but it will take me six hours to get there and it will take me two whole days to do an hour of work for you. So I'm just not coming. The the alibi you had, which which allowed you not to share your story, no longer exists. It's never been easier to put your story out there. But the key point, and, and you know this, of course, uh, Bashir, is that we have to be very clear that we're involved in an exchange of knowledge rather than a transfer of information. So easy, even as we tell our stories, even as I make my presentation today, I will think that I'm doing something and sharing a particular understanding with you, and I may get most of that across. Mm -hmm. But if I have been useful, if I have been inspiring, if I have made people think, then they will begin to do other things which I will not have imagined with my thoughts and with my projections. So we have to recognize yeah. that translation is inevitable uh, and you have to be at some level comfortable with that. Yeah, thank you. So we have a few more minutes. Um, I think you're free to ask questions, engage in, uh, in a conversation with David.
Um, I'm getting the opportunity. I can get uh, hold of David again, so I'm then going to ask another question. Then. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Bashir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just David, is the uh, is there a modeling of culture now going on? I mean, is the organization say well, you, you you mentioned that is culture is sometimes is ex it's, it's actually exists this, uh, organically, you know, in the organization. Yeah, if yeah. you can say we. We know you have a, a, a dress code, a, a special code for the dress. You have certain way of communication between the employees, between the upper, between the upper and lower yeah. parts yeah. of the organizations. Uh, even the way that they are people behaving inside the organization, it's different from one to another. You know, yeah. What appears to be here as a taboo for certain organization, it might be something normal for other organization. Yeah. Um, so what will happen if the organization starts to model its culture, to make it a model that is can be installed or implemented as cultural change, what they are talking yeah. about cultural change now? I, I, I have particularly bad tempered thoughts on this. So my position is that mm. the organization will most probably fail. But the essential dynamism of organisations as cultures will allow the managers to claim success. You see, the formal statement about the ability to change culture says oh, it'll take about five to 15 years in order to change the culture. Um, that's assuming that culture can be controlled from the top down. In the absence of management and in the absence of any planned um, development, what you will find is that on a day-to-day -day basis, the rules will be bent, the understandings will change, people will move on. And if you come back in 15 years, if you are careful to view that culture, uh, you will find that change has occurred anyway. Right, yes. if I upset you by being rude about culture change. No, no. Yeah. I see Rale's oh, so uh, hand up. Uh, <laughs> So we have another uh, question from Radish Popeye School. Radish, please, please go ahead. Hi, David. Hi, how are you? Hi. So um, your hand went up like a shot there when I started to <laughs> say rude things about culture change. I'm a civilized uh, <laughs> person. So hi, everybody. No, you're not. Oh, yeah. Um, I I was involved in uh, some uh, cultural uh, changing pro projects since 2010 with the uh, tools like uh, I don't know the circumplex of uh, human synergistics and uh, a lot of things. I was so involved and uh, I I also studied cultural change and. At one moment in time, one of my friends gave me the HBR uh, uh, magazine from that yeah. month with a great uh, title, You Cannot Fix Culture. Okay, yeah. this was a joke, Yeah, <laughs> I think. But I wonder, what, what do you think about fixing culture? Because in 2020, in Deveselu, Romanians voted a dead guy who died two weeks ago and they voted because he was on the list and uh, they said okay he was a good guy so they yeah. voted, voted him you know on this Sunday um, this is a cultural problem from for organizations but also for people so it it, it comes from from within you know the, the the culture is from within basically and it's a yeah. psycho psychological trait of the society and the organizations can you fix culture or how can you measure in what terms so in which um in how many years you can fix a culture or another based on i don't know a, a, a study or another study no. i mean there are so many uh, it's a fascinating question thank you and there are so many different ways to to come at this so i began by speaking about the deal in Kennedy aphorism and it's how we do things around here and I was saying that one of the things we're going to talk about is to talk about we is to talk about an inside group and an outside group. So the notion that culture might be fixed is to suggest some notion of perfectibility. 
and to suggest some notion that somewhere at the top there's a grown up who knows what should be done and will fix this for us. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that associated for me with the most vibrant and the most significant cultural formations is that they are self-organising to some extent. Um, and if we go back to 1989 and the manner in which um, the good people of Romania said, well, we've had enough of this now, um, and the manner in which that occurred, no one said, I'm not sure when people said Romania is a culture which will accept authoritarianism. And I'm not sure when anyone said, and Romania is now no longer a culture that will accept authoritarianism. But somehow or other, uh, you managed to secure the very, very significant, worthwhile and enduring change in the manner in which you uh, live and govern yourself. Um, so while accepting that change is, I was joking, of course, about cultural change, while joking, of course, that you can do things that will have an impact upon how think, people think, feel and act, you also need to understand that your ability at a level of detail to shape how people think, feel and act will be very, very much limited because you allow people to go home at night. They come to you from schools and from families and from all manner of different things. And they're used to navigating and negotiating the complexities of social life and kinship and family. And they'll continue to do that within the organisation. So if you're wise, and my book attempts to walk this tightrope between control and cooperation. If you're wise, you recognise that actually cultural formations are significant and people will do things for symbols, for a little bit of ribbon on their chest that they won't do for a million pounds. And Donald Trump fails to understand that. He regards medal winners as mugs because they didn't get any money. People will do things for symbols and will do things for their friends or for an ethos or to reflect a particular set of values. And the challenge is to develop stories that authentically capture that, mm -hmm. honour it, acknowledge it uh, and give people a way to be while recognising that they will take liberties with the stories that you tell. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's nice to both us here with uh, people from Romania, really. I'm feeling like uh, there's similarity with Libya as well, you know, when we talk, uh, when they are talking about the cultural change and how difficult to change the culture is we are not uh, at the beginning. Everyone wants the revolution, you know, and they get rid of the Gaddafi that time. And now half of the society, maybe they are crying for the Gaddafi, you know. <laughs> In different ways, we're all fighting the man, Bashir. Yeah. <laughs> so, do we have any more questions? We still have a few minutes. You can raise your hands, just type the questions down in the chat box or simply ask them. Okay, so got another one for you, Dave. Uh, okay. What about fracture, fracturing an organizational culture? Yep. Uh, and fracturing means building up, uh, building up from what what Rares spoke uh, or asked uh, before, and your your answer. Uh, so organizational change in terms of organizational culture, and you somehow encourage certain types of uh, behaviors and. Uh, uh, stories, uh, as you put it, and what happens if you do this uh, too often, because that's the organizational culture, and mm -hmm. it usually tends to fracture, because uh, yep. it's w w when you're trying to bend something uh, that needs time to be bent, uh, uh, it, it's, of course, it, it, it's exposed to, to, to risk. What's your, what's your take on uh, on failed changes of the organizational culture? Um, I'm not sure I have any particular take beyond saying that the cultures are a lot easier to break than to make. And it yep. only takes small missteps and things that would appear trivial to us in order to develop a real sense of discord, uh, a real sense of betrayal uh, within the organization or indeed across the organization. Um, 
And one of the things, I'm often very rude about Tom Peters in my work, and I have to say that I often regret this because he is um, unflinchingly polite whenever we have any interactions. And I said to him um, at the start of the global pandemic, I guess what we're going to understand now is which chief executives in America and elsewhere will pass the Turing test. Which one will demonstrate that they are human and which among them, and most of them, I guess, will fail, would demonstrate that they are uh, robots, they are ciphers for accountancy and accounting concerns and so on. So, so the, the key point is that I, I guess I'm saying is it, it won't take much to, to mess it up. And it comes down again and again, in, in, in my experience, to process issues. It's not actually really what you're wanting to do. Um but how you're planning to go about doing it and whether you're demonstrating through your communications uh, and through your management of the system that you really understand, that you really get what's going on. And in some sense, you're not unsympathetic to the roles and concerns that, that others have. And that would be my my take again and again and again. Um, and it is a, the song, isn't it? It's not what you do. It's the way that you do it. OK. Makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. So, any new thoughts on this from the uh, from the audience? It's your last chance. So, I imagine, David, you're not coming to Romania anytime soon. So, if anyone wants to address any questions, it's it's this is the time. You, you can track me down, and if there are other <laughs> questions that, that, that become apparent to you, um, or that you're just too shy or too embarrassed to ask, um, that, then we can find a way of, of, of addressing these. Um, before we conclude then, I, I should say it's been a delight again. It's been lovely to be able to uh, share some time with you uh, and to talk about the book on stories and storytelling, especially because, as I said, um, it's inspiration and indeed, some of the stories uh, come from working with clients uh, in, in a Romanian context. And if any of um, if any of those uh, are present, I do hope you recognise yourself within the text. Um, it was the fastest book I've ever written. I conceived the book in September and gave birth to it by Christmas. I've never written a book so quickly in my life. And I joke that it almost wrote itself. Um, so I, I do hope that uh, if you if you get around to reading it, I do hope you'll see um, uh, the real sense of enjoyment and the real sense of passion that came through from writing about it. And I joke um, that especially the opening discussion, uh, which is talking about culture, is wonderfully bad tempered. And I hope that those who know me um, will hear my voice very, very clearly in that particular text. And I should say and I'm paraphrasing the work of an, an earlier social anthropologist uh, called Cooper, that I'm beginning work on a new book, which a new slim volume, uh, which is dedicated uh, narrowly to the study of organisational culture and storytelling, which again then is an inspiration from the storytelling workbook. And that will have new stories and fresh insults, and that should be out next year. By the way, David, could you um, type in the chat box or send us a link that we could share with the participants from where they can order your book, your new book? Uh, you can get it on uh, Amazon. It's available. I say it's available from all good root retailers and some rubbish ones, too. Perfect. So Amazon. Yeah. Or if you go on to um, Taylor and Francis Routledge, um, uh, you, you'll find it available directly from the publisher. I have to say that I have not yet myself received a physical copy. I think there are restrictions around warehousing and no one yet sent me a copy of the book. So if you do get your hands on one, uh, you'll be a step ahead of me. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> it, it is available. Um, I should, oh, there we go. Thank you, Rarish. Um, I should say it is available because a contact... Um, within the Pentagon, of all places, wrote to me to say that he'd, he'd managed to get a hold of the book. Um, one sec, I think we have another question. One sec. Yes, 
uh, Rajesh Popescu has pasted um, the link for your new book mm. in the chat box. You find the whole back catalogue there too. There's also, um, it came out almost in the same week, a new book about management gurus, um, which uniquely for my work doesn't really say very many rude things about Tom Peters, but it does conclude with the suggestion that we have misunderstood management gurus. Um, while we think about them like being like religious preachers or whatever else, uh, my suggestion in this book is that they are rather like stand-up comics. They're not laugh out loud funny stand-up comics, but in terms of the manner in which they conduct themselves and the manner in which they develop modalities um, to encourage our affiliation and our agreement with them, they are the right, they're, they're rather like uh, stand-up comics. So you might find that entertaining too. Thank you, David. Um, Thank you very much. It was a delight having you here again. It's, I'm, I'm very grateful to you for the invitation. Um, it's wonderful that people uh, wanted to give up their early evening. Uh, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, it's been uh, it's been great to hear your voice again, video, and I do hope to hear you again, speak to you again soon, uh, and see you back in Cluj for a beer. I hope. We really hope that we're and looking I'm so excited forward to that. Bye this time. <laughs> oh, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you, David. Thank you. We will share with you thank the you. recording uh, and the presentation with David Kindness. And um, if you need any links to David's work, just ping us an email and we'll help you with that. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. For thank you, everyone. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. It's nice Bye. to see Bye. you. Bye. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Nice to see you. Bye. 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 B